build upon this. So you want to learn this material. If you're going to go through that much effort to cheat, why not just go through that much effort to learn it? OK, so respondus is required because it is a way for me to monitor and make sure you're not flipping your phone on and looking up the answers. You're not having notes out or using your book inappropriately. OK, and you have to use it for your lecture test. You have to use it if you're taking the online lab test. Otherwise, you're going to take it for quiz one and quiz one is about making sure respondus works. If you do not have a computer that will run respondus, you need to go to the library the second this class is over and ask to check out a loaner computer. This is one DR loaner. OK, they have limited amounts of computers, so if you don't have a computer that will run it and this is the week to find out, go get one. Right. And as they have computers from the libraries, and if they don't have it here, you might have to take a trip to Forest Park or Wildwood or somewhere else to a library to see if they have them. OK, most of you seem to have computers, so hopefully they work. OK, so let's respond. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Other things, so we need to get to the slides. One. All right, so Respondus Quiz is due 11.59 p.m. Sunday night. Again, it's five points. It's over chapter one. It's not meant to be super hard. The point of the quiz is to make sure Respondus works. Okay, going to chapter one. Slides. And you guys probably can't see them all that great, but we're starting with chapter one, privacy matters. No, not that. All right. Okay, so again, this is what our textbook should look like. Okay, these are the older versions of the book if you are really, really wanting to find a cheaper version. Okay, most of the slides that were with the orange book was when I started here in uh, 13. The slides haven't changed with the, any of the textbook changes, so that's why you can kind of keep using it. OK, if something happens and your book gets destroyed, stolen, lost, and you have to buy a new one again, you can probably buy one of the ones for cheaper. OK, I'm about to push that. OK, so objectives for chapter one. First off, we got to start learning new terminology. So we got to start learning universally. OK, we got to start learning the names for the different pieces and parts of the body. How are we going to start cutting and dissecting and slicing and dicing the body? Right. And then we're going to start learning how we start looking at the body from a macroscopic view and then peeling it down towards a microscopic view. This class, anatomy and physiology, is everything from typically the cell layer the cell level up. So it's a little bit microscopic, microscopic, but mostly macroscopic. Most of the things we're going to be able to probably point to and see with the naked eye. You have to typically, if you're going to nursing school, take a micro class. Micro class is going to overlap a little bit with what we do between now and A and P2 because it starts at the cell layer and goes down to chemicals and then some of you have to take chemistry because we don't do enough of how things are bound and made into molecules so you take chemistry all of that really goes back to levels of organization you're just kind of covering material at a different level of where it fits in the level of organization okay and then when you get to public health classes because some of you are going to get masters in public health now so the next pandemic you can be the person on the tv talking about how we handle things from policy pro, pro, policy purposes right nod your heads yes say yeah that's me okay that level public health starts looking at things from populations and communities and a global level okay so when you get your internship at the world health organization or the cdc because you're working on your master's and phd you'll be up at that level okay so that's how that kind of works Right. Um, the only thing that's kind of physiology in chapter one is how homeostasis works. 
So we'll go through that and go through some of the typical examples. It never fails that that segment of the book talks about a computer and a CPU or talks about the temperature and the thermostat in a room. OK, so those are tend to be the normal kind of global ways to explain homeostasis. And then throughout the semester, we're going to hit on, OK, here's where we are. How do we get back in, in in homeostasis? Anytime you get out of homeostasis, your body works to get back in. If you get out and you stay out, you might be in a pathological state. So again, we're going to leave some of what happens when you stay out of homeostasis long term. So you're nursing in your pathology and pharmacology classes. OK, and then we're going to again go anatomical terms, body cavities, start learning how to be universal in our language. If anybody bought the international book. There may be a few words that are a little different. But we will always go back to what does our purple book say as the Bible of that is what we're going to call things. OK. All right, so. Anatomy versus physiology. So if you were to be at Mizzou today, you would take a two semester series of anatomy first, and then you would take physiology second. OK, a lot of major universities do that, especially if they have cadaver labs and they would throw 300, 400 people in a lecture hall for anatomy lecture, and then you would break out into small groups for lab. And the lab would be mostly taught by a masters or a senior you know junior singer level teaching assistant okay but you would then spend time with cadavers smaller schools that may not have cadavers tend to do things anatomy and physiology together so our semester series is amp1 amp2 so we're going to get through the first 18 chapters this semester and then when you pick up amp2 we pick up from chapter 19 through chapter 28 to kind of think about what is anatomy versus physiology. Anatomy is something that you probably are pointing to, you're naming, you're labeling. OK, so anatomy is about the name, the label. What is it? So an anatomy class, you're very much going to spend time on labeling this because it looks like this. Labeling and pointing to this because this is what it's called. This is where it's located. Bones and muscles are very much anatomy centric organ systems because mostly what we do with bones is we point to them, we name them, we label them, we point to the holes, the divots, the pieces and parts poking out of it. OK, we grow bones and then we work the rest of our life to not let them break and fall apart and. Disappear. Muscles are the same things. We both basically point, we we label them. Uh, we say where they're attached. We say where they're originating. You know, that's the that's the anatomy part. And again, a lot of uh, muscle is we grow it and then we spend the rest of our lives hoping they don't shrink and disappear. OK, so very much this class has a lot of anatomy. It has histology of what are the different tissues and what do they look like and how do you identify them? The second lab is all about bones. The third lab is all about Muscles, so there's a lot of anatomy this class. Anatomy has a lot of memorization. OK, the second part of the class, it's like hearts and lungs and digestion. There's still some anatomy of what is this piece of the heart? What is that part of the heart? What is this little divot? What is this little hole? But there's a lot more physiology. Physiology is function. How do things work? OK, and then after you learn kind of how things work, you usually go into pathophysiology, which means how are things working incorrectly and what does that look like? And then you go into pharmacology and treatments to figure out, well, how do I bring pathophysiology back into normal function? All right, we grow bones, so there's not that much physiology because you, you have to learn how to grow them, all right? We grow muscle. We learn about how muscles act. So how do they move? And then we hope they do that for the rest of their lives. All right. Nervous system and endocrine at the end have a lot of physiology and we have some physiology a little bit with the integument and things that's up. But this class is not physiology heavy. So in some ways this is the easier of the two classes because this is a lot more anatomy. 
This is a lot more memorizing. I don't make this class hard because it's hard because you're going to memorize 200 and something things by test one, memorize 200 and something things within two and a half weeks for test two. So we don't make this hard. There's just so much you have to learn. OK, now A and P2, I would say is a little bit harder because yes, there's some stuff you have to memorize, but there's a way more emphasis on you have to understand how this works. OK, so you kind of get off a little lucky. The one skill you need to learn this semester is how do you memorize and how do you best study? Because once you figure that out, you're going to be helping yourself handle A and P2 better. Typically, A and P1, the biggest thing that you have to handle is how to take a lab exam. How do I memorize 200 things, walk into a room, I get a blank sheet of paper, and I have to walk up to these models, these pictures, these slides, and recall all this information and spell it correctly. It is a learning curve because how many of you have had to ever take a test where there was no word bank? There was no multiple choice questions or potentially words hidden in the material. So this, this is a new way to test you because most of us, if you give me multiple guess and the answers on the page, I can guess right. And if you ask me to identify things and I at least have material to go back through, I can probably recall some of those words and remember and then go, oh yeah, and then this and this. This is a test where you really have a blank sheet of paper and you have questions and you have to come up with all the material. Okay, so this is the hardest thing about a and P1 and you are very, very quickly week four, then week seven going to find out if you can do it. When you a and P2 happens, most of the time lab exams are the easiest part of the class. That's the easy part. That's the I just memorize this and I just recall it for you. So learning how to do this in a and P1 is going to be your first big challenge. And I'm telling you now. How many of you think you can memorize 200 things in one night? If you wait till the last day or two before the lab exam, before the test, you are going to fail. OK, so that's part of the reason why you have the labs do as kind of a way to gauge you. That's why you're going to have quizzes every now and then to help kind of make sure you're keeping up with the material. That is why I want you meeting with Caitlin once a week because Caitlin will do fun activities to kind of make sure you're learning the material. OK. All right, so anatomy versus physiology. So if I ask you, what is the name or structure of blah, 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 you would be, okay, that's an anatomy type of question. I'm looking at something and I'm labeling it, okay? If I ask you how something works, what's its function, you know that's a physiology thing, okay? I am a physiologist, so I have my PhD in cardiorespiratory physiology. My previous life, I was an aerospace physiologist in the Air Force. So I spent a lot of time training people to think about when you go up in altitude in airplanes and they're not pressurized, what's going to start happening to your body and how can we try to fix that? All right. And then I did my research in if you had rats that were slow runners and didn't like to run, and then you had other rats that were genetically runners and you could put them on a treadmill at four weeks of birth and they would just run, 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 run. If we induced injury in the cardiovascular system, what would happen? Would there be protection genetically in, embedded in these rats that were slow performers versus high performers? Anyway, that's all in the past. Now I teach, okay? And I love AMP2, so I usually teach three or four sections of it. I like AMP1 because I like muscles and I like some of the stuff, but I will tell you there will be times I have been there where it is like an eye poker to the eye trying to get through material and that's okay, right? What you take away from some of the material being, oh my God, this is painful to read, this is painful to study, that might not be the area you wanna go and become a doctor or a nurse or work with, okay? So if you do not like the nervous system, do you want to go work for a neuroscientist or a neurologist or those people, the googly got people, I call them? No. 
Do you want to go work in uh, psychiatry? No, because that's what they do. All right, so questions so far. Where's the clock in here? OK, because I will continue to talk and talk and talk. So and if there's no clock, I will just keep my going. So make sure you guys um, stop me when it's time. All right, so these are just some other descriptions of different types of anatomy, different types of physiology. So again, you will probably see one or two questions on your lecture test of what is potentially something that's an anatomy question versus what is something that's a physiology question. Almost any time we take blood, are we looking for something anatomy related or physiology related? Physiology, we're looking to see like your, your hormone levels where they're supposed to be, or are you in a pathological state, you know, those kind of things. Um, if we look at the spine for, you know, the, the anatomical structure of you or, you know, spine, what's the scoliosis or lordosis or is that potentially more anatomy or physiology? It's more of an anatomy question. All of these are kind of in the gray because what would be the follow on question? Well, why are you like this, right? Am I like this because I have weak pec muscles and strong traps or am I like this because maybe I was in a car accident and had, you know, so there's always like those follow on questions, but that's kind of what the point. When you test your vision, anatomy or physiology, Physiology mostly, unless you're again trying to tell if the eyeball anatomically is big or small, but you know, so most of it's physiology. I can make every one of these a well, it depends. Okay, and you're going to get to that point where every question is like, well, it depends. Well, it's a, you know, it depends. All right, so testing joint stability again, you're looking at is the joint have all the pieces and parts it's supposed to have? That's more of an anatomy. Is it working? functioning correctly a little bit of physiology okay so again i keep wanting to do that all right okay so again i told you these levels of organization so at this point in time what you need to know is kind of like the the flow chart and you need to know the flow chart if i ask you from smallest level to largest so you would want to start with the chemical so chemistry then it becomes one or two atoms combined and form molecules. Molecules come together and form organelles. Organelles come together and form cells. And by definition, cells were what we think of as the smallest unit of life. Two or more cells coming together and starting to specialize form tissues. Two or more tissues come together and we start to call them organs. A few organs work together and we get organ systems. Put a few organ systems together and we get organisms. And we're stopping there. Put a few organisms together and you get communities. Put a few populations. Blah, blah, blah. And then you have the globe. And then you have the universe, right? Okay. So you need to know the layering of can you potentially fill in the blank if I give you the list of what goes where? If I ask you to give me the order from largest to smallest, so you have to read the question. So that's how I trick you. Is it largest to smallest or smallest to largest? Fill in the blanks. Those are the way these questions will come up. Okay? So it's not, it's not hard. It's the attention to detail of what is the question asking me to do? Smallest to largest, largest to smallest, fill in the blank. Okay? All right. Organ systems. Depending on your book, some books are going to tell us we have 12, some are going to say we have 11. Depends on how they do reproduction. Okay, so some books will say there's 12 because there's a male reproductive system and there's a female reproductive system. Some books will just say there's reproductive system and then they subclassify them as the male version or the female. So is it a good, fair question to say how many organ systems there are? No, because again, it depends on which book you're talking to. Okay, um, but for right now, you need to know what are the 11 slash 12 organ systems that are typically found in human bodies. The only one we can live without is our reproductive system. So if you try to take away any of these systems, 
you're going to have a problem with light. Reproduction is the only one we can live without. Reproduction is the only one we potentially can do without or ignore or not utilize to its full capability. We don't have to have children and reproduce. Okay. All right. So you want to know what each one. So you'll learn there's the integument system. There's the skeletal or osseous system. There's the muscular, the nervous, the endocrine. Those are going to be the ones we are going to go through this semester. Then we'll pick up cardio, respiratory, lymphatic. Sometimes lymphatic and immunity are together. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Respiratory, digestion, urinary, reproduction. Now, within these, these, think of these like the cliff notes. What are some of the major organs within? So expect to be asked, the small intestines belongs to which major, major organ system? Okay, so some of these big major organs listed, you would be, if asked which to put them in an organ system, you can put them in an organ system. Now, some belong to multiples. If I ask you, the pancreas belongs to which organ system? What could you say? It's in the digestive, but it's also in the endocrine because it makes insulin and glucagon, okay? So sometimes organs belong to multiple organ systems, but for the most part, some of these belong to one, okay? And then you want to kind of know like the cliff notes, what is the major feature for most of these? So respiratory, we got to get oxygen in, we got to get carbon dioxide out. Blood, cardiovascular, we got to move around the nutrients, okay? So in lab, and in lecture, you need to know these. So these might be organs on the table, labeled, identify the organ or identify the organ, um, organ system it belongs to. Okay, those would be lab questions. Lecture questions would be potentially the same or something of like, you know, those ACT things like heart is to cardiovascular as small intestines is to digestive you know so kind of like those little weird i don't even know what they're called questions okay all right so far how are we doing this is not a hard chapter but if you're going through and you're looking at bold terms those would be things you want to make sure you know where they fall what they are you don't have to know how they work, what, you know, all the intricacies of them, just kind of the big ticket items of where they belong and what they do, or not what they do, what, what organ system they belong in. Okay. Homeostasis. We don't have enough time to really go through this, but you at one point were a cell. Everybody believes in evolution, and if you don't, that's okay. But at one point, supposedly, we were all single cells. And those cells wanted to be in an environment to best thrive. Most of the time they wanted to be in an environment that was slightly warm. They wanted to be in an environment that was mostly surrounding behind them water on the inside and outside. They wanted a certain pH, right? And as the cells became two or three, it became bigger. Same principles. We want to be mostly water. We want to be certain pH, we want to be certain temperature. And our body works very hard to keep those homeostatic conditions that are ideal for all the cells in our bodies to thrive. If the temperature gets too high or the temperature gets too low, what, start happen what happens to cells? They start to die. Okay, so that would be things that we would fight to come back to homeostasis. If we get too acidic or too basic, what does our body try to do? Dump acid or dump base to get us back into the right pH because that's where cells and proteins and molecules work correctly to keep us alive. Okay, so that's really what homeostasis is about. It's just these ideal conditions that we have evolved to live within, right? And what we're finding is a lot of organisms in this planet, that's their conditions they live in. Okay. If you were to put us all in a bunch of vat of oil, would we all survive in the oil? No. So do we have to put our cooking oils in the fridge? No, because most organisms 
don't thrive in an oil background. It's not where their homeostasis would keep them alive. Okay. Questions? Okay, so we are done. We will meet.